Okay. So I've made over 100 games, which is one of the reasons why uh, I have some qualifications to be giving. So I don't. I want you to. I want you to know where my information is coming from, so that uh, y'all feel like you can trust it to the amount you're willing to. Uh, so first, many people here likely have a oh, awesome Q and A tab. Should I? Uh, all right. So I. I'll just. I'll do Q and A stuff at the end. Uh, I know I said at the beginning, so that, that's on me. But uh, just because we're in stuff now. Okay. Hey there. So thank you, y'all, for showing up. So I've created over 100 games. You can see them here. Uh, yeah, I, I, it was it was my childhood. Some of you may have seen the Roblox story, and uh, uh, about me, which was a surreal experience, but uh, one of the best ones of my life. Um, it, it, it's not every day you get to see so many people just really well, get to know you, but then uh, also relate and empathize and just be like, oh, that that's just like me. That's that, and uh, yeah. I, <laughs> there's a reason I didn't actually edit the documentary. I'm not always the best at communicating the you know, more emotional side of things, which is why I study game design because then I can bring it down to a math model and all that stuff. So let's continue. Okay. And so I also was an intern for uh, in the summer of 2017, 2019. Um, the first one I had a Nerf gun, then I got upgraded to a flamethrower and the second one. So, I mean, yeah, the, I can only, uh, wonder what the next internship will be like. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. And also to people who are considering applying, definitely, definitely apply. I learned so much from these internships and I will be talking a little bit more about what I learned uh, later on, but just know that this kind of stuff uh, was very helpful. Just being able to around, be around so many talented people. Uh, it's like, <laughs> it's like the dev forum that just, uh, it's like, it's like every great aspect of the dev forum just amplified and I like, okay, people, people feel like I'm like complaining when I say this, but when I was there in 2019, I was at the Roblox HQ literally every day. There was not a single day which I did not step foot in the office to work. And that's not because they told me to, in fact, they told me not to, they said, please go home, uh, enjoy life. But no, I, I, it was just so, it was such an amazing experience. I, I wish it to everyone who has that option. And also, I am one of the few people who decided that of all the college degrees to get, which could get a job, he decided to get a degree, which would not likely get him a job. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but it gave me a lot of knowledge. I was a game design major for two years. I, before that, I was computer graphics major in, uh, at Purdue and briefly a UX design major, which I was not great at. Uh, and then I, I had the internship and I thought, wow, I want to learn. I have so much more to learn about uh, game design and I need to actually go to a new college to learn it. And so I got to be under some brilliant people there who taught me so much. Um, my average 3.8 GPA is uh, just just to clarify, that is from the games classes I took. My GPA average was not 3.8 across all classes because some of them are boring and they weren't related to games. And I don't know why they made me take them but 3.8 average GPA, <laughs> but I graduated. So uh, I did not graduate with a game uh, design degree because, well, we'll get to that, but the, the gist is the, it was a three year program and the third year was mostly just making a game in my opinion. And while well, I've already made a few games, so why spend another year's worth of college money when I could just start making games? And so, I've made them and okay. And then books, this is something uh, y'all can probably do. It, it's definitely, there's still obviously a little bit of a curve because books cost money most of the time. But if you go to a library, I've seen half of these on the shelves, um, especially the behavioral economics stuff. the Dan era, the, if I had to recommend a single book on this screen, it would be the one which I've sized four times as big as the other ones. Um, and that is Predictably Irrational by Don Ariely. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about the kind of stuff that, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, in my experience, wider industry books are more helpful just because the kind of things that go into making a Roblox game, you can typically find from a, a wider industry game or even just wider field. Like a lot of these are like, I think only row two here 
um, deals at all with game with like uh, with actual like game industry. And then row uh, row one, there are three books on game design stuff, but it's not. You know, those, most of these are just like general psychology and behavior and uh, all of that fun stuff. Yeah, and so I, I recommend Don Ariely's Predictably Irrational because that is what uh, was recommended to me back in 2017 by uh, Sorkis. Sorkis basically helped Superhero Life 2 not be a complete flop because he, he play tested it and showed me a lot of ways the onboarding process needed help. And if I, if I hadn't fixed it, uh, I don't think it would be as successful as it is today. And so I definitely recommend Predictably Irrational. And if, if, if you enjoy my presentation today at any level, Predictably Irrational is very helpful. And uh, it's just an intro into the field of behavioral economics that's really fun to read. And to those more focused on monetization, uh, they talk a lot about uh, how, how our brains deal with money and all that stuff. And it just... Read all of his books. Okay. Uh, and so what have I learned? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there'll be a few slides like these. Uh, yeah, this is my legacy. Okay. Uh, so in order to understand fun, you need to understand player motivation. In order to understand player motivation, you need to understand players. And in order to understand players, you need to understand people. And in order to understand people, you need to understand their limitations. And that is, um, and that, and, and that's going to be our process. It's going to be a general structure. We're going to start at the bottom and just understanding the limitations. And then we're going to build up from there all the way until we understand fun. And uh, that's the goal. Now, let's understand our limitations and why it is so hard to comprehend this photo. <laughs> now, we can, we, can con we can wonder a bit why someone would put ducks in a mug. And there's a good deal of confusion there. But what, uh, what I'm really talking about is the image itself, is the information stored in it. Like, like you see a cup, you see ducks, you see it appears to be in the Robux HQ. Um, you see someone working in the background. Uh, you see quite a few things. And uh, that is how we've categorized it, how we see it. Now, let me actually show you what the image is, because as you may have guessed, this isn't actually a real thing in front of you. This is a photo of a real thing. And that photo has been digitized, which is important because with these kind of, uh, with, with uh, computers, you need to break stuff down to its pure information. And so let's view this photo through the lens of what a human could possibly remember. And that is long-term memory. So the world record for remembering pi is around uh, 100,000 uh, digits in. Uh, and that is a lot of information. It's not even necessarily the human extent of our memory. From what we can tell, uh, the amount of information you can store is much larger than that. But this is, as far as I can tell, the largest uh, memorization of a single topic. So if you studied this photo for the rest of your life, <laughs> um, then, and, and by the way, I'm right here, I'm having it as, a, I'm using the RGB standard. So each pixel is about three numbers. And if you stared at this for the rest of your life, <laughs> or probably not the rest of your life, but just a few years and memorized every bit of information and then recited it for 16 hours, this is the level of detail you could get which is much different than this. But like, that is nothing because this is still very good compared to what our working memory is. Our working memory, that's stuff you can remember at a single time. It's when people tell you to, to remember these numbers, it's what you can keep in your head at one moment. This is what the image looks like with working memory. <laughs> um, I couldn't even use the RGB standard anymore. I had to go back to 8-bit uh, colors because um, you'd need two people to remember this many pixels in RGB standard, actually maybe even three, let's see, so it's six times three, so it's 18. So about like two and a half, uh, because you can only remember about seven to eight numbers. And if you're lucky, nine. Uh, and you may think, well, wait, I can remember my phone number. That's long-term memory. I'm telling you, if I just say that, uh, some random numbers off the top of my head, like 7409252514, uh, you can hold maybe that many numbers. But beyond that, it, you start dropping them. And here's, 
here's something you may have noticed. That image does not look like this. If we were just interpreting the information on the screen and then seeing it as it is, hypothetically, this should be what we're seeing, right? Like it's an, it's an, it's, it's the amount of information we can comprehend. Why does it feel so different than this? Because we aren't actually understanding the information. We are using something called a cognitive bias. Now you've probably only heard of cognitive biases in the negative sense. But what, I'm going to, what we're going to be talking about tonight is how they're actually necessary for our comprehension of reality. So this image in front of you, this is an image of a neural network. You may have heard of them in computer science type stuff. Neural networks are fascinating. They're the coolest bit of computer, uh, computer science right now. Basically, how they work is you have a bunch of raw information, a uh, hypothetically infinite amount. Like we're talking a pi uh, every pixel of an image broken down to um, yeah, and, and into individual numbers. And then you have those numbers correlate randomly with a middle layer. Uh, and then that middle layer just repeats the process, correlating randomly with another layer. And then it all correlates to a final output layer. And by and what you do is that you set the output layer, and uh, just in case anyone's not aware, uh, not too familiar with it, a correlation is just a number between negative one and one, which tells how similar something is. And a one to one would be completely similar. A negative one would be the complete opposite, and a zero would be no recognizable relationship. And so, by randomly setting these, we've basically created a base uh, a behavior pattern. And so you run input through it and then you get the output. And if you know what the proper output is, you can keep on training it by randomly tweaking the numbers until you have, uh, and then and then uh, selecting the ones which are uh, the best versions and then uh, continuing to train them some more. And you keep repeating the process, taking the best version and training it until you have a set of correlations between the layers, which lead to the determined outcome. And so what I'm saying is that that's how our brains work, because it is. We have all of this sensory information, all those colors, all these cones in our eyes which receive information, all the, all the nerve cells that go through our body that receive physical information, taste, uh, smell, uh, even stuff where we detect gravity. We can, we can detect so many different things. Uh, what I, can, I don't remember the entire list. I don't think there is an entire list. It gets kind of blurry. But the uh, point is we have so much information we have, we can see this image and through basically neural network behavior in our brains, we filter it and reduce it to these interior middle zones. And then it comes out with a single result. We look at this and see duck. That is duck. And that is cup. And that is duck in a cup. And that is an odd thing for a person to do. And here's, and actually that, that brings up an interesting point. This photo, still requires more information than is shown right here. Like you need to understand uh, what ducks are. You need to understand what a cup is. You need to be able to read English. You need to be able to understand uh, how gravity works, how fluid works. Like you need to understand how light refraction from that, the surface of the stuff in the mug makes it seem like liquid. Like there's so much information that is not here, which you need to understand it. So that's just a whole other thing. And point is cognitive biases, uh, are these middle layers. They're very unclear. They're, they're, they aren't really uh, directly shown to us, but through measuring our behaviors, we can uh, hypothesize their existence. We can, we can determine, oh wait, so when people are given these exact information bits, it, it continues to change this behavior at the end in this way. And, and we can figure out how they all interact with each other. And that is the basic idea behind behavioral economics, how our brains take the complicated world around it and simplify it. And that simplification is very necessary. So I'm honored to show y'all the Cognitive Bias Codex, which is the most helpful tool in my, in my experience for understanding this. It takes every known correlation we have between behavior and input and maps it out. It shows how we handle too much information. Like, like so where, when I'm talking about like the, 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 the biases uh, that we have are trained for a certain level, level of information. And when we overwhelm even that, this is how it behaves. When we have not enough meaning, when the biases, the cognitive patterns we have, in, we have don't uh, give us the right thing to do, 
this is these are our plan B's right here. Need to act fast when we don't have enough time to process stuff to get more information. This is how we behave. What should we remember with with all this information? What do we store for later? And you can see each one of these is broken down into their own smaller categories and these very interesting patterns that we can see across different biases. Uh, we notice things already primed in memory or repeated often. Uh, so if you say the number three, 80 times in a row, and then write down a random number, there's an increased chance you'll write down a three. And that goes with anything that, that, uh, that goes with habits that goes with that, that goes into so many different behaviors and uh, bizarre, visu funny, visually striking or anthropomorphic, the anthropomorphic things stick out more than uh, non bizarre, unfunny things. This is uh, this is the result of stuff to help us get the most important information first. And typically it's people because obviously humans are very social. So being able to recognize people instantly is very helpful. And obviously people who recognize people much sooner over time, we're more likely to uh, succeed in, in uh, continuing their line. And we'll get to that stuff later. I, I was getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, we notice when something has changed, pretty basic pretty important. We are drawn to details that confirm our existing beliefs. I think that's one which uh, it gets a lot of media coverage because typically when you hear about cognitive biases, you hear about these ones. You hear, you hear about like, you hear about the ones that make people say uh, things you disagree with. And this is typically associated with them. Uh, and in all honesty, typically right and wrong You'll find people who are right, who just happen to be right because of these biases. Like there's no, there's no like super rational person out there. If you're, if you have to be right on something, you're just happen to be, have these biases in the right direction. You're not necessarily like the superior individual. Everyone's mind can be accidentally swayed in different direction, which is why it's very important what input uh, people receive. It's why parenting is so important. It's why schools are important because the, what you are shown influences how you think indefinitely. Uh, and and also we notice flaws in others more easily than we notice flaws in ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, I'd say that's that's pretty true. I, I think there are a few, uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that the flaws you notice in others are also different than the ones you notice in yourself. Like, I'm not saying nobody here notices flaws in themselves, but the, the one, the, but there's a different level, there are different flaws. They're like, they're, like they're different types, like, uh, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of things. Read, read the books on it. I can't talk. I can't give you a 20 hour talk on just this page. Not enough meaning. Uh, I tend to find patterns in, in, in sparse stories. So uh, this is very interesting because basically if you have a button which randomly turns on a light, like, uh, or just any, or just uh, a light which randomly turns on, don't even need a button. People put in a room will develop a theory for how to turn that button on. The, some may think it's tapping their foot will sometimes get a turn on. Some people think it might be leaning forward, but like if it randomly happens, it's been shown through multiple scientific experiments that people start associating that buttons turning on with completely unrelated behavior. And this kind of stuff happens more often than you think. Like uh, a very, a very funny, like first world op uh, version is uh, crossing the street with uh, uh, traffic lights, like the walk signs. They're the buttons you press to cross the street with. And sometimes they'll just turn them off. And so like, you'll press it and it was always going to turn on the walk sign for you. Um, and then sometimes it won't. And so you'll get these situations where even when a person knows that, uh, <laughs> Eddie, they're, they're, like you'll, you'll get situations where people will behave certain ways, even when it's not reflected in knowledge, they know, they know this light doesn't work. Um, but they'll, but they'll attribute that same behavior onto various things that uh, com could be completely unrelated. And we fill uh, characteristics, stereotypes, generalities, prior histories. Uh, this one also gets a lot of media coverage. And uh, it's definitely one which has caused problems in the world, but also it's literally how our brain works, uh, attributing stuff to things like fire, for instance. Touching fire has a stereotype of burning you. I think that's an accurate stereotype most of the time, but I'm sure you'll find every once in a while there'll be a situation where like holographic flames or something won't burn you. But the reason our brains work this way is because uh, it's this, this entire stere uh, stereotyping and generalities and prior histories. I mean, that's literally just learning from history. 
uh, not everything will always be an exact duplicate, but obviously in our modern world, we've recognized it's uh, negatively affecting things. And uh, so this is not necessarily an excuse saying we can't fix anything. We can certainly improve stuff. It's just this, the, the bias itself is not evil. It's neutral. And anyway, I, I, I can't just run through these for the entire hour. I, we're gonna, <laughs> nobody will be around. Need to act fast, uh, stay focused. We favor immediate relatable things. Uh, we like preserving autonomy. We like doing all these different things. And uh, we reduce key lists to their key events. We discard specifics to form generalities. And also a very important one, we, re we edit and reinforce some memories after the fact. And that is cognitive bias. And it is not random. Let's talk about the training, which led to our current bias. Because that what I've just shown you is mostly about how we think, like processing information to understand it, uh, which is useful. It's very important, but it's not what makes a player play your game. What we're about to talk about is emotion. It's the feelings. It's, it's the sensation, the motivation for why someone joins your game and why they stick around because, uh, let me water. That's oh, a RDC cup. Uh, um, Let's see, that wasn't planned, but I mean, I have so many RD, <laughs> I have so many RDC cups at this point. It, it's very possible that it can just show up. Okay. But emotion, it is what drives us. It's what we associate with giving meaning to life. And that's true, but not in the philosophical way necessarily. It's true scientifically and we can show it. Uh, let's go, uh, let's, let's first dispel of a certain uh, misunderstanding that is pushed. It's the idea that your emotions are hormones, that, uh, that, that oxytocin makes you feel more love, that, that uh, all, all these different, like cortisol makes you feel stressed out, dopamine makes you happy, serotonin, uh, it makes things less painful. All, uh, like all these different hormones have been associated with uh, certain, be certain emotions. When they're not, it, let me explain. So, what this is, is just a case of uh, correlation. Um, yeah, I think, I think you can rejoin. I, I, I uh, believe it's just all, people can even join late if they need to. Um, all right, so the, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so in terms of how our brains actually function, the, it, it's very much like someone associating Black Friday. Every, uh, we just had Black Friday a few days ago. Would anyone here describe Black Friday as the time when there are more post office workers delivering packages? No, it's because these chemicals, these hormones are just the delivery system. They're just what connects different um, parts of the brain. And they are released in larger amounts for certain emotions, but that's a correlation. That's, that's part of the mechanism. That's not actually the, the mechanism itself. That's, it's very much, uh, how, it just, it, it'd be like describing a video game as a bunch of ones and zeros and uh, certain video games as being, having more zeros in them. Like it, 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 it's, it's not meaningless because it's a great way for us to track certain uh, patterns, but it is not emotion itself. What emotion itself is, is survival instincts essentially. And I think I choose that word because uh, that's how they started. Um, <laughs> And so we have uh, some survivalists here to help us through. Um, and it's all about because how you feel keeps you alive. And even at the very basic earliest stages, we're talking about unicellular beings, like the E. coli bacteria make, uh, makes you sick sometimes. It will mutate more rapidly when under stress, when, when under and in more dangerous scenarios. This is a very basic survival instinct and, and arguably it will eventually, uh, upon a few million years of evolution, <laughs> will become a something we would describe as an emotion. I, it is a motivation to our behavior, which helps us out, because that is what emotions are. They help us out. They exist because they help us out. It eventually, through with multicellular beings, became what we know as fear, a very uh, the stuff like fight and flight that kind of started showing up, uh, communicating there like uh, that you're in a certain way that that's more social we'll get to that but stuff like a rattlesnake for one it knows that if something comes 
close to it that threatens it, it can attack and try to hurt it, or it can try to escape. That is a behavior pattern which exists in the same way that fear does. It, because you can feel it inside of you, obviously, and but more importantly, it'll sway how you act. A person who's feeling afraid will behave differently at some level, whether it be increased heart rate or whether it be like running out of the room. Fear changes us physically and our brains are physically part of us. And so with fear and evolved species, we have these kind of more, um, we, we have, we've gone from the unicellular, just, just start gen mutating more to try to escape stuff, basically f almost fully flight uh, but I guess you could say fight because they are parasitic in nature. But anyway, different different thing. Fear. It was arguably one of our first emotions. It kept us alive. And because it kept certain people alive, because it evolved with some people just randomly being a little bit more uh, fight or flighty, was more likely to go into that under certain circumstances, more likely to either fight back or to run away. Certain species really dedicate themselves to one or the other. Humans kind of got both, but that's not necessary. I think most species can do flight, except for maybe like a mollusk or something. <laughs> like, like uh, obviously this exists in plants as well. Like it's life. It, um, and so fight or flight that exists across most species in different amounts. And eventually it, uh, we get another big emotion, which is long-term goals. It, this is stuff you usually hear associated with dopamine. It's, it's the uh, behavioral patterns that allow us to do things which are not immediately gratifying. Uh, this was another example of certain people, uh, it's not people, sorry, certain organisms at some point were just a little bit more, uh, their behavior just helped them out a little bit more in the long term. And because of that, they were more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. And thus, those kind of behaviors became more and more ingrained in certain species. And then eventually, social motivations, where the realizing that living in groups can be a situation which helps people out. And so there's very much a pro-social benefit to being around people of your same species, such as obviously uh, protection and also uh, reproducing. That's much more helpful when other people in your species are nearby. But also it, it gave rise to the negative emotions because uh, most people who've taken a biology class will remember ecosystems die due to overpopulation. If too many organisms group in the same area, if too many people stick together, you end up getting a situation where there might be too many of them in the same place and that can backfire. Uh, and so in a sense, sir, it appears over time, negative antisocial motivations have also been rewarded through natural selection. And because of that, we have stuff like anger. We have, we have uh, things that uh, work against other people of our own species and also contrary behaviors, which work towards uh, the benefit of a species. And so it's, it's all these different, uh, different motivations, all these different behavior patterns, which drive what we call emotion, because they're not really these separate, this, there's not an emotion part of the brain, it's just the brain. And how it's evolved over time dictates these built-in behaviors, just like the cognitive biases. These are emotional biases. These are, thing, these are behavioral survival instincts that have evolved long past what we typically, uh, what we typically attribute to survival, because uh, typically, you, you can fairly easily understand how running away and fighting can help you survive. But in the long term, you'll need more survival instincts, which is why it's no surprise that um, you'll see uh, certain animals like those shown here with longer lifespans than say an insect with a less developed longer term planning and less, de uh, well, I wouldn't say less developed social behavior, but it's different. We can agree it's different. Um, and so, that is the basic way our, our brains operate emotions. And so now we understand emotions, which means we understand motivation. How does that, how can we bring that back to players? And so what I've decided to call the triumvirate model, it's taking this kind of stuff and combining it in a way which allows us to apply it uh, in a certain manner. It's a lens. It's, this is not what I'm showing you right now is there's not a, there's not a success part of the brain necessarily. There's a so or a social or survival part. There are correlations to areas like survival. That's typically amygdala social. That's more, more frontal lobe, uh, success. Um, that's a smaller part of the amygdala, but it's definitely in there. So like we, 
we, they, there are areas of the brain which show that it this these things evolved set like over time. This all this all didn't happen at once. Um, but this is there isn't a there, there aren't specifically like success or social or survival organs in the brain. Uh, and like uh, like many lens actually, because uh, this is one thing I recommend to people. It's uh, an art of game design. You can either get the book format or the lens format. It's uh, it's an amazing tool for game designers. It is just a bunch of different philosophies and ways to understand stuff. Uh, there are literally hundreds of cards in here. Like here's one, the lens of spectation. <laughs> ah, it's convenient. Um, for thousands of years, man has loved to sit and watch others play games, but only if the games are worth watching. To make sure your game is spectator worthy, ask yourself these questions. Is my game interesting to watch? Why or why not? How can I make it more interesting to watch? And it's just a bunch of these little little ways you can think, uh, think through your problem. It's super helpful for brainstorming, super helpful for getting like uh, other people's ideas into your thought process when you are limited to, with, to only a certain amount of people on your team. Uh, what a break. All right. Uh, and so this is a lens like that, something you can use to help simplify the hyper complicated world and hopefully get some workable insights from it. I call it the triumvirate because it's a three person dictatorship like that back in ancient Rome. And with it, I like to think that these three major things dictate how a player will enjoy your game. Like it's just, these are the three big things. And you'll notice there's overlap and we'll get to that. So one other cool thing about the triumvirate model is it can be applied on top of existing models. Uh, there are a lot of existing models for game motivation one I particularly like is the Quantic Foundry model. The, the Bartle type, though, is very, um, uh, the tri uh, triumvirate, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe I'm saying it wrong, I don't know. I, I know I'm just saying it with an accent. This, this is the way Hoosiers say it. <laughs> For people in Indiana, we, we need to rebrand. Um, yeah, but the, the big uh, personality traits, Bartle types, Quantic Foundry model, you can see these broken down to social success and survival. And... Uh, they even combine, oh, sorry, <laughs> oh, the title, okay, yes, uh, it's by, it's by, Je it's by Jesse uh, Shell. Uh, it's also one of the, it's one of the first things you get that gets recommended on most, like, best game designer tools lists. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, but no, the uh, big five personality traits, that's when you may see more in psychology senses, you can break that down. Uh, Bartle types, once again. Uh, the Quantic Foundry model, I think, is really interesting because unlike the other ones, the Quantic Foundry model was built up out of, emer it's emergent from a bunch of uh, survey data, which survey data isn't perfect. There's a lot of ways you can skew it. In fact, I know the way they collected it has a lot of flaws, but it still does show trends. And uh, it apparently was not flawed enough to break up these kind of uh, patterns. And so you'll see that things sort of cluster together in a social survival and success areas. Um, which I think is very interesting because that means that we have two different scientifically based areas reconverging, which gives more credibility to this idea that all of our motivation is based on these three areas. But the, the, this is not a game. You're looking at this and you're not going to think, wow, I could look at this for hours. This is so motivating. I, ah, I can't wait to get home from school so I can look at this, the, the triumvirate model a little bit more. How do we turn this into a game? And I think it's easier to first understand how existing games fit in it. We have stuff like Minecraft, which, because it's a sandbox, can really fit uh, across multiple categories. We have Stardew Valley, which is very, it's a very success-based game because you, you're you completing tasks. Uh, and so that, that's, you, you, that makes the task completion part of your brain happy. You have long-term goals, all the stuff that success likes. Um, social, on the other hand, uh, so here's, here's what I dislike about uh, existing models. Too often they seem to limit social experiences to multiplayer. I don't think social is multiplayer because to me, social is just hijacking the part of your brain which was built up around social behavior. And that means uh, the emotions that you gain from interacting with other people. Stuff like crying at a sad scene in a movie because you're invested in the character. That character isn't real, but it feels real. Yeah, uh, who here has ever been emotionally moved by a game? It's the same thing. It's social. It's a social part of our brain. And it doesn't need to be multiplayer, but if you're not ready to do 
hours of writing and and uh, uh, limit yourself a lot because typically uh, pre-written games are difficult to make replayable. Uh, then multiplayer is obviously a much easier way to make your game social. But it is not only multiplayer. And I think that's very important. It can very much be an immersion of fantasy. Fantasies are often very social. They're, um, they're, they're, they're a new world for you to live in, to interact with the people in, to be someone new. It's an identity thing. And identities are very social. And also, of course, we have survival. Um, now, obviously, Rocket League does not end with like the executions of anyone. Um, and uh, you know, I guess, well, maybe figuratively. I'm, I'm very bad at Rocket League. And so we have uh, competitive games. We have very much like uh, going against another force. Uh, it can be a person or it can be uh, the game itself. It, it can be going against a storm. It can be going against, uh, let's see, your own limited resources. Survival is very much a, uh, it, it's, very, it's very much a thing which can make a game compelling. And it's, but it's not just like survival crafting games. It's often seen in like games like Call of Duty, uh, let's see, and uh, obviously Rocket League, and also a few Roblox games. Let's take this Roblox centric. You may see some of uh, the games you've played up here. In fact, some of you may have even made, made or worked on them. Um, that, that's what's so cool about uh, this kind of community stuff. You, you could genuinely meet some of these people. Um, and so we have stuff like Adopt Me and Royal High being much more social uh, experiences. I wouldn't say it's too much of a competitive game, though. I'm sure there are ways to compete, and I'm not sure it's too much of a success-based game, though I'm sure people feel a sense of success when they uh, enjoy a certain, when, when they when they purchase something or when they get a new pet. There, there's definitely a, a task completion element, but by and large, I'd say the reason people play Adopt Me, they play it because they like getting to meet people and they like getting to live in this fantasy of having a nice house and all that stuff. I doubt many of them would say, oh, I love Adopt Me because of the competitive nature of it. <laughs> or, oh, I love Adopt Me because I, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a, a, a long-term, I love the long-term strategy aspects. No, 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 Adopt Me social. Um, then you have some games like Welcome to Bloxburg, which are also very competitive, but it is more of a success-based thing. People like making these cool houses. They love sharing them. Um, yeah, well, so Prime, Eco Scratcher says an interesting lack of primarily uh, survival type games. And just a heads up, uh, I think maybe I removed it, but for a while I had a slide about Booga Booga because that's a sandbox game. And sandbox games are really helpful. And uh, like, like Minecraft, you could say, is a survival game in survival mode. But survival games in general, um, it's... The, the, the thing here is not so much that there aren't fast-paced games that really rely on survival mechanics on Roblox, but just Roblox is a hyper-social platform. How many games on the front page right now are single-player? Like, can you think of a single one, honestly? I'm trying to think of a single, single-player game that has an active user base. Horror games are fun, and, and I've seen some really well-made ones, but I have yet to see any of them succeed. Um, at least financially. Uh, I'd say that a lot of them have succeeded artistically. But survival-wise, you really don't have these, uh, you really don't have games that aren't super social. Um, so yes, Bee Swarm Simulator is less social. But I'd say there's still a social element because it's, at the end of the day, it's not a single player game. There is an element of flexing. That, that, that's why I love using that word to describe uh, social competition. It's like you, you get, you get so many more bees, people look at you and you're like, oh yeah, Mr. Kuga, I have all the bees. Um, very relatable. And just as a rule of thumb, to figure out if a game's social, just think how few people are needed to make it fun. Like, like, like And also, it, through adding other people, could it be made more fun? Like, I'd say a game that's very antisocial would be uh, Cookie Clicker because Cookie Clicker is a single player game. It's very deep in the success realm. You don't really, there's not really much to show anyone because you, you, you'd be too embarrassed to admit you play Cookie Clicker. Um, it's definitely, but I, I play it all the time, I love it. Um, it's on my phone right now. And survival wise, like uh, you can have a player versus the world type thing, like horror games. I think horror games, uh, someone mentioned this earlier, are tip, like, typically they are single player 
And typically they aren't that social. In fact, they teach you to fear people, which I guess is still a social behavior, but we don't got to get too deep into that. Uh, and uh, I have, so my most successful game, uh, I've been, my games have been played around 200 million times. And uh, I had a whole, I had a whole bunch of slides back. Uh, speaking of social flexing, um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm a full-time game dev. I, I was able to end college a year early and just go make games full-time. This is my office. Yeah. And that was my battery pack. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, flexing over, though. And back to, back to the stuff you're interested in. Yeah, not that I'm not very interesting. The survival area is typically fairly antisocial. Uh, you don't typically have social games that are that uh, exist beyond social, but I could think of a few, like you could say that Joker, the Joker movie was an antisocial social experience because it's about a person. It's like, it's like you're bonding with a person, but it's really just one character. Um, so there, it, it gets messy. Anyway, you could think of a dozen different ways to apply this to a game. And also I think it's worth mentioning that not every player will enjoy a single game type for the same reason. Like. Um, in my game, Superhero Life 2, uh, it's been played over 100 million times at this point. There are very much two different types of players. There's a player who loves the role-playing immersion social stuff. And then there are players who are a little bit more uh, fighting uh, loving. They, they're they a little bit more in the survival, fast-paced action, but also a little bit of the success of, of uh, when you beat someone in battle. Like, the, uh, like those are the kind of uh, deviations on a player level that you could find uh, doing and I would not suggest trying to split your player base. It makes designing for them very difficult. Just make a new game if you want to target a new a new type of player. But just know that on an individual level, a person may enjoy your game for a reason other than that it was designed. Like think of a <laughs> think of a bad movie, like you, you like like a B movie or something. People enjoy the room not for the reasons Tommy Rizzo, I think that's how it's pronounced, not for the reasons he wanted it to be enjoyed. And uh, in a sense, that's what happened in Superhero Life 2. I thought it'd be a lot more fight stuff. <laughs> I never said the B movie was bad. It's art. It's, it ascends movies. Um, and so with, uh, with my games, arguably, I had sort of a, 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 a The Room type situation where the reasons Superhero Life 2 succeeded were not necessarily the reasons I intended. I thought it'd be a lot more combat based. I thought it would be a lot more people fighting. I didn't realize how much the how important the role play stuff was until off, honestly after my third game. Now Superhero Life Four will be very, um, will be very role play heavy because I realized that's actually the, where the core player lands. Um, so you can learn from games that already exist, but if you enjoy something differently than others, try to recognize that so that you don't think the reason people play Ragdoll Engines is because they have a deep fascination with stairs like you a stair simulator will not necessarily do as well um all right yeah uh so oh yeah for sure yeah uh Tyridge brings up a good point if you're designing a multiplayer social game or even just a social game we're talking to npcs uh it what one issue is uh on is getting everyone in the same spot and we'll be talking a little bit more about onboarding and, and tracking core loops and motivations later but just know if you don't make it to the end <laughs> Um, that uh, you need to have people to talk to. You can't, you can't like, imagine you're playing a chess game with someone, but like the chess board, like there's like, like is on the other side of the room. Like, so you each have to walk there and back every time you make a move. Like you need to keep, you need to keep people close. And uh, so definitely, uh, definitely think a lot about map, uh, map design when it comes to social behavior. And honestly, any of these. Uh, map design and making sure all players are within the right range of each other is important for all these survival like a first person shooter game would not be fun if it was all taking place in a room this size um it'd be chaotic and there might be some joy in that but it would certainly not be strategic you'd get almost like a fully survival focused chaos game um that's different from natural disaster survival honestly but or shark bite shark bite you're literally in a small boat so but it's a big map anyway uh success stuff as well uh with like uh, the, the bee swarm simulator, you need to be able to find areas in the map and you need to be able to see other people doing stuff so that you can both learn from them and also aspire to be them. <laughs> be them. Okay, and yeah. Um, 
that's a different talk, <laughs> honestly, in any, in any further detail. It's a very important thing to learn, but it is not the focus today. But yeah, so here, here I am on this. Uh, you'll notice a, a similarity. We, we both have a, a rocket jet pack with miniguns. Um, and this is the type of game I usually enjoy. And we're going to be designing, for my preferences, not necessarily because they're the most popular, I'd say the uh, typical player probably is a little bit more social than I am. Uh, but all that stuff is uh, only so... Uh, but but I, I don't know that person. I'm not talking to them right now. Let's design for what I know because, well, I know it and I've been able to think a lot about it. And uh, I think that... It's a good litmus uh, test. And also, there's no better way, in my opinion, to make a game. It's definitely sort of a shortcut. and might not be sustainable long term if you want to get into a full industry job. But in just uh, in, de in designing games that you enjoy playing, you will always know if your game is fun. Um, and that'll help you a lot. But it can blind you. Sometimes uh, you'll play your game and then you'll just uh, you'll think it's amazing and then people, other people won't. That's, that's a huge problem. It's one I've experienced so many times. But it's a solvable one. And, ar and arguably, it's easier to solve than if you, if you don't even know why your game is fun. If you know why your game is fun, you can work to, to, to emphasize that, to get more players into that zone. Uh, so make games that you like. You have that option right now. You might not if you go into a AAA uh, game job. But right now, you're an indie dev. You can make what you like. So do it. Don't, don't waste the opportunity. Get good making stuff that you like. That's how I did it. Those hundred games back there, uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but <laughs> there was a lot of Star Wars, a lot of Star Trek, a lot of Marvel, a lot of my interests, because that, <laughs> because that was what helped me keep going. That's what motivated me to keep making stuff. And yeah, so, but let, let's, 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 uh, let's assume for a moment that we don't necessarily know why we enjoy certain areas and break it down to mechanics uh, and trends and mechanics that could uh, help, um, sorry about that, uh, uh, that, that, that could help us recognize them in other games. So uh, survival mechanics, jump scares are helpful for stuff like horror games especially, um, but it's fast paced. Um, horror games, now just to clarify, they're kind of weird in the sense that they aren't necessarily always fast paced. Like there will be quiet moments where you're just walking around waiting for a monster to jump out, but those work because you're still on the edge of your seat. You're still like, like uh, you, you're, you'll, you'll still be very afraid. Like I watched the Conjuring, uh, the first Conjuring movie a few nights ago, and I, started, I was annoying the heck out of my girlfriend because every time something scary is about to happen, I'd say like, oh, it's a fake out um, because they would have the music play up right before it and every time the music plays up they fake out and then in the quietness after the fake out they scare you and so then once it's quiet afterwards i'm like oh here's the real scare and she almost kicked me out <laughs> i do not recommend watching a movie with me but oh yeah oh you live near the conjuring house i think it was pretty creepy i heard there was some all right no not off topic look it up though interesting stuff about that house all right, and the, uh, you know, like a whole bunch of legal stuff. Is it obvious that I'm ADD? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got, I got all the A mental illnesses, so, woo! Uh, let's see, the, okay, yeah. So quick avatar movement is also helpful. And we have, uh, we, we, and that's especially for like, uh, first-person shooters, because if you have a slower gameplay that's competitive, typically it'll go more into the success strategy area because it's not, uh, most of the gameplay is not defined by fight or flight. And that's that's the really big picture. When I say that these are the core motivations for these games, I mean for the actual core of the game, for what you're doing most of the time. Not that, I'm not saying there will never be a success moment in uh, an in, in adopt me game or a survival or like a competitive moment. I'm saying 95% of the play experience is not that. 95% of the play experience is motivated by social behavior. And so sensory overload, loud noises, sudden bright lights, all that stuff, uh, especially apparent to me, it's just, uh, I, 
That's why I don't play horror games too much. I don't like I don't like the loud noises. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Did you know what the reason I don't have a 4.0 in that one GPS that I showed earlier is because I'm bad at sound design? It's just, it was one class. It just tanked everything. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not great with uh, video game sound. So someone please make a video game sound talk so I can redeem myself. Uh, destruction, that's also very much a survival thing. It really gets you into a survival mode. I think that's fairly built in. I, you could argue it's, it's, it's emergent from the loud noises and sensory overload and chaotic stuff. But I think to an extent, there's also just a natural selection where people who run away from explosions are more likely to survive to tell the tale. I think, I think that's, that, that, that could very well be a uh, thing like run away from destruction. Um, and chaotic, of course, which as I said, could be related to destruction. So those are survival mechanics. Those are the things, if you want your game to be deeply survival based, this is where you, this is where you keep it. This is, this is the, the, the attributes that are associated with it. And with success mechanics, the intent here <laughs> is to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishments. Uh, anyway, uh, so success mechanics, they often have a clear win state. Uh, you won't have an ambiguous ending like say Minecraft. Obviously Minecraft did add the end, but I'd say most play styles are not necessarily to get to the end. Um, and those who are, well, that's achievement based and that's success. Uh, Minecraft is a bad example. I'm sorry. It's a sandbox. It, it has every it has every motivation in there. But uh, let's see. Adopt me. You can't win. Adopt me. Anyone who says they're winning, adopt me is has a very interesting take on things. It should probably give their own talk because I don't think you can win. Adopt me. Uh, and same with natural disaster survival. You can. Uh, Fall guys is definitely uh, because there's a clear winner. That would definitely be um, uh, partially in the success area. In fact, I, did I put it on the initial games? listing I, I don't think it, i meant to no i didn't but yeah no uh platformers especially those are very success oriented in fact that's oftentimes they're more of a survival success because there's like the fast paced aspects of a platform that get your heart racing but at the end of the day you do it because you want to complete the course you don't do it just for the joy of having your heart race a little bit more um yeah so clear win state and then it sort of related but also different clear threats to delay destroy the win state um, now you don't, because you don't necessarily have to have a lose state. Like uh, Cookie Clicker is a great instance of a purely success game, in my in my opinion. It's not really any fast paced gameplay. Your heart never really races, because you never actually lose progress. You'll you'll get like these little cookie eating mite things, and and you'll slow down your cookie production rate, but you're always getting closer to that win state of having unlocked everything. Though I think that one might actually go on it infinitely. But you, you basically, the win state in that one can be intrinsic. Uh, all these mechanics can be intrinsic versus extrinsic, which means directly stated by the game as well as uh, or versus what the player just wants to do. Like an intrinsic goal in uh, Minecraft would be to make a house that looks like my house or something. Um, and you can design for intrinsic mechanics. I, I think that's something which some of the best games do. You don't necessarily have to make every single goal in your game just hard-coded into the design. Allow, allow your players some freedom. If you remove freedom from a game, you just made a movie. You made a movie in the most expensive way possible. Uh, no, 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 you're making a game. Give player freedom, let them choose stuff. Um, and anyway, so clear threats, that's also important for a success uh, thing because if you remove threats, if you remove the option for a less than optimal uh, playthrough, then, well, what, what do you? There's, there, you can't make any decisions. Literally, nothing you do matters. That's why I don't like Uno that much. Um, it's because there's not. I feel like some games need more mechanics, not less. And uh, compare game performances, and have uh, so that means stuff like leaderboards is a good example. But even just recording your own high score, like leaderboard, doesn't need to be uh, super. Leaderboards are inherently more social usually, um, but they don't necessarily need to be, uh, <laughs> um, they don't necessarily need to be social for to get the success type stuff. Um, and the uh, completed over multiple sessions, uh, this is more of a trend than a necessity just because 
you'll get stuff like like uh, 4X games are a great example. They're hours long. Chess is typically a longer game. Just with, 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 with highly strategy-driven games, typically you see it lasting longer. I think the shortest strategy-driven game I could think of would be like tic-tac-toe. But honestly, when you get to that small of a, of a, of a game, it almost starts triggering like, like fight and flight, like like uh, aggression, survival instincts. So I wouldn't even say that's a that it's it's a it's either a very bad success game or an okay survival game. And so that leads us to the final one: social mechanics, which is very important. Highly advise uh, you listen to this because Roblox is possibly the most social place on the internet. Like it, uh, it, it needs other people to be fun. Like. Uh, Arguably, the existence of Reddit shows you that social media does not necessarily need to involve other people. Roblox needs other people. And so most social game on the most social area on the Internet. And so with that, you have typically fantasy and immersion intensive. Now, this one is not necessary, but it's helpful because if you allow the person to be someone else, they can get a superior experience than to what they're currently getting in real life. Like... Uh, for instance, let's say you have an insecurity with the way you look or the way you talk or anything. In a video game, you don't have to deal with that. You can just be what your ideal version of yourself is. And as to whether or not that's healthy to promote, that, that's a different talk. But the point is, by giving the players the option, it allows some escape for people who much need it. I know in superhero life, I've had multiple people tell me how uh, they're uh, d physically disabled in one way or another in real life. And to be able to just run around with super speed when in real life they're in a wheelchair uh, really made a difference to them. And uh, so it's definitely, fantasy can be something that's very helpful, that helps people uh, at the end of the day very much uh, keep on going. And so in that sense, definitely, definitely consider fantasy. It, it can be really helpful. And in my opinion, there aren't too many downsides short of uh, violating a, um, I guess, artistic, uh, aesthetic, like some people really like realistic games. And in terms of uh, multiplayer, but also NPC based, I think I talked about that earlier. Uh, requiring cooperation is super helpful for, especially for multiplayer games. Cooperating with NPCs can be, can backfire <laughs> unless the NPC is coded very well. Uh, but cooperation can get people talking, can get people interacting. And in social games, interaction is key to the fun. So cooperation mechanics help a ton. Uh, and also, one thing I've noticed that's really helpful with uh, this go this builds on the identity stuff I mentioned earlier. If you give someone a unique task or identity, they will absorb it into their own identity, and they will be prouder, and they will feel more motivated and more connected uh, than they would otherwise. Like uh, in you see this in like World of Warcraft, a ton, where they'll have a, a little a group. What are they called? It's not a clan. Clans are bigger. It's a, I, I don't know. Uh, is it obvious I don't play that game too much? Uh, the you have a group of people and they'll have specialized roles, guilds. Oh, they, no, that's still bigger. What, what's that? What's the small one? It's like it's a group of people like going into raiding parties. Thank you. Okay, yeah, raiding parties, and you'll have uh, specialized uh, like you'll have healers, you'll have people attacking, you have more melee, more ranged, all that stuff. And in giving people that unique task or identity, they feel like they belong more. They feel more integral. It's much more successful than, say, a situation where everyone has the exact same uh, impact on the world. By giving someone a sense of unique, uniqueness, it builds back on one of those cognitive biases way in the back saying that we need to feel like we can change something. And when you have a unique role, you feel all the more important for it. And, that's a, and that can provoke some uh, very uh, compelling uh, motivations that uh, are very helpful from a social standpoint. Because... When it feels like not only that your thing is very, that you, you're the only one who can do this task, but that other people are relying on you to do this task, that is very helpful. So I definitely would suggest thinking of ways to do that. Like uh, Overwatch is another great example. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Team Fortress 2, which pioneered a bunch of the stuff Overwatch does. And yeah, you could find a long list of ways for this to, to be realistic. It's, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is another great example. Anyway, but let's put all this together. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Tyrus brings up a good point, saying that uh, more roles uh, makes your game more accessible. It makes it so that you're not so much pinning it on a single, um, 
a single view or fit because having different roles does not necessarily mean uh, like if we go back to the uh, this stuff being on one area like it's always going to be a little bit run you can't ever get like pinpoint accuracy in reality you can design for pinpoint accuracy but to an extent you also don't want to make it so exclusive that only one person can enjoy the game you want to make it so that uh, people in this general area can because odds are the mechanics you're designing will allow some variance in preference like think of uh let's see a survival crafting game like uh seven days to die is a great one that i've enjoyed a lot or i guess more played uh, arc survival evolved some people may really enjoy the more social training dinosaur stuff and some people really may enjoy just the fighting the, the fighting uh survival stuff or the crafting success stuff that's a sandbox game as i said those are typically very broad but in my experience, they are uh, very compelling because of that. Because there's enough room for players to enjoy certain things, but it's also not so. But it also doesn't force them into any one play style. Yet they all mesh together so well. I do love sandbox games. I wish there were more of them on Roblox. Uh, best one I can find at the moment is Booga Booga, and probably like Jailbreak and Mad uh, Mad City are probably in second place for uh, sandbox type gameplay. Anyway. Um, so oh, let's take the little, um, the, I guess, this little recipe. To me, uh, like, uh, you should, it's helpful to think of this stuff as like, it's two, like two parts uh, success, one, one part survival and a, and a dash of uh, fantasy. Oh, no, wait, no, dash of social. I think I said that right. Anyway, the, uh, when, when you break that into actual mechanic traits, we can start assembling a uh, an idea of what the game kind of feels like there's going to be it's going to be strategic there's a clear goal it's a longer game and there are threats to victory it's also has some fast-paced moments it there's some destruction moments and at the and while uh it's not the majority of the experience there is an enjoyment gained from it being fantasy and so we have all this and now let's combine it let's merge it create a base and work towards an end game uh fight monsters and immerse your first person gameplay. Now you could take the previous stuff and come up with a dozen different ways to do this. These are just how I saw them uh, turning into a mechanic. Like, like trust me, you could, you could do this limitless number of ways. And, but the point is, if you're basing it off of these motivations, it's much more likely to actually evoke them. <laughs> like, like it's much more uh, planning something out than just flipping a coin and hoping you've made the right game and I, I, uh, so let's take these motivation, uh, sorry, these mechanics. We got, we were at a, uh, I guess a, it's like a quasi mechanic. We're going to break it down the mechanics with the core loop on the next page, I think. Nope, pitch. I, I'm a, I was in a game design school. They told me all about pitch statements. Now I got to write them everywhere. Okay, so a pitch statement is just a one, like, it's just a, a one state, it's a statement that you can give that describes your, your game to someone who has no idea about it. It's also sometimes referred to as an elevator pitch. Uh, anyone considering applying for the Roblox internships, you will need to give one of these if you are going to the accelerator program. Uh, so get good at pitching. It's very helpful, especially in the indie scene. And so the pitch I've come up with for this game is in this first person survival crafting game, you play as a steampunk pirate trying to build the best airship in the sky so you can take down the sky leviathan monster that ate your family. Yeah, that sounds fun to me. <laughs> I, I, it, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can imagine that game. Some of you might, might want to make it and you're welcome to, I'm not, I'm not claiming it. And also a pitch statement isn't really, in, uh, in my opinion, that defendable as a final product. You can make these in like 20 minutes. And that's the thing with design. Your, your game design stuff will be like 10% of your work at, at, at worst, but it will be a hundred percent the reason your game succeeds or fails. It's the decisions you make. I mean, that's what programming is. It's uh, That's what game development is. It's deciding certain routes, what certain strategies to take. So in my opinion, a little bit of uh, preparation beforehand and thinking through why your game's fun can help all the more at the end of it. Uh, a game of mine called Mortal Metal that I, w that I made during my last internship, it flopped. And you know why? Because at the end of the day, 
I never actually sat down and thought, who is this game for? I thought, I'm going to make it for everyone. And I highly advise against that. Unless you're making a sandbox game, do not try to make your game for everyone because it won't work. It'll be like, uh, imagine uh, going to a restaurant. There's a dish which has a little bit of what you want on it. And there's another dish which has exactly what you want. Now, the one dish might have a little bit of what everyone wants on it, but no one's going to pick it when the thing they actually want is somewhere else. Like, yeah, people could enjoy Mortal Metal, but there were better versions of it. There were better versions of what they were looking for already available. So do not go for every audience. Go for one. Go for one and then try to get as many people into that specific audience as possible. And, yeah, so that uh, that is how motivation can be built up into a pitch and from a pitch to a core loop. Now, almost out of water. Okay, so progressing, in this case, we have explicit mechanics uh, shown in the pitch statement, which are helpful. However, the deducted mechanics will be the things that those mechanics need to, to exist. Like, you can't upgrade your ship necessarily without having a way to progress through upgrades. And so you have, like, need to earn upgrades, need to find monsters, uh, need to evolve the challenge over time, because uh, uh, obviously strategy and long a longer game can only be fun uh, if the game evolves. At least, I, I, that's my opinion. I guess there are probably games like chess where... Well, even though chess is different because the stakes of the game change as stuff goes on. The early game will almost always be different than the end game. And uh, so you need to find a way to incorporate that into your game, uh, especially if you're going with this kind of setup. And so using that, I was able to pin together a core loop. Uh, you defeat a monster, deliver the monster to collect uh, the monster's bounty. Uh, that could be cool because then you have to do a risk-reward type thing where you go out and you... you, you feed a monster, but now you have to drag its giant monster body all the way back to the docks to sell it. So um, you can decide how far do I want to go to do this? And it could also be a way to encourage people to get bigger and better airships. And uh, these kind of, like, you never want to have a game mechanic, which is just the best idea. Like, like, there, like if you can't always do a risk reward, a, a cost benefit, always have them give up something. And with that, you get compelling game. And in fact, one of the books on the original screen, uh, it's by my old, prof uh, my old professor, a guy named Mike Sellers. He's all, his thing's all about systemic gameplay, which deserves a talk of its own, honestly. But systemic gameplay in the gist is gameplay which uses some well-defined mechanics that work off each other to create a infinite number of situations. Uh, well, not typically it is infinite, but Comparatively, there is a limit usually to how many meaningful situations you can get from a systemic gameplay. Uh, but chess is an example. Minecraft is a great example. Uh, like the, when mechanics build off each other, every addition you make, every additional mechanic that's added, adds more that you can do in the game. It works off all the other ones. Uh, a game, a totally accurate battle simulator is one I recommend to people who really want to get into systemic gameplay and what it's like. Um, but yeah, so back on topic. You have a core loop. What can I do with that? <laughs> and so you make the game with this core loop in mind. You release it, or you have testers in it, <clears throat> but it's not succeeding. Why is it not succeeding? Why, why, why are people entering my game but never coming back? How come I can put ad up after ad, and they just don't play my game anymore? The answer lies here, or in onboarding, but we'll get to that. And let's focus on the core loop stuff. You can track how people go through this core loop. In fact, you can probably imagine it right now. Uh, stuff like uh, airship creation and upgrading. You could determine how, you could measure how long they're in the airship editor. Uh, you could also determine uh, how many monsters they kill. How often are they being defeated? How often are they defeating the monster? How often do they get back with the monster's body to collect the bounty? Like, uh, how far out do they usually go? Are they always going to the stronger monsters immediately? Like, these kind of analytics that track progression through a core loop are super helpful because you may find people 
are doing fun at the airship creation stuff, but then they never actually leave the dock. Like they might just stick around and be like, I don't know what to do. And that's partially an onboarding problem, but also there could be a situation where they go out and fight monsters, get killed once, and then just stay close to the shores ever since. Like you need to find ways to measure that they're flowing through this quote. They should be flowing through it. They should not just complete it once, they should complete it multiple times. And the more times you can get them to complete it. And by the way, when I say that, I know some of you may think, oh, I'll just make things faster. That's not what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is that you need, in completing the core loop more times, if you just make it faster, then you have to have them complete it more times for the game to be compelling. That doesn't necessarily help. You just want them to keep on flowing through this because that is what gameplay is. That is what a fun game is. It is flowing through this core loop again and again and again and again and again. And oh my, the sun is back up, but I just had a great night playing Minecraft, which has the simplest core loop ever of, uh, it's just like uh, survival, crafting, exploration. Those are the, I guess exploration would be like slash discovery, but that is what a core loop is. It's just running through that th that pattern of three things. Uh, well, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be three. I love core loops of three. Honestly, this one's a four one and it does the, and it does the job and it should be four, I think. I just love core loops of three. I don't know, it's weird. I think I just love three. My model has a three in it. It's, uh, it's probably a bias in there somewhere. Uh, people who wear too much flannel will be biased towards threes. Okay, um, but yeah. So core analytics, uh, core loop tracking with analytics. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if, if you uh, disagree in terms of uh, core loop tracking, uh, this is to, to clarify, play testing with actual people is also very helpful. I'm not saying this will be a replacement for that, but I, I do think that um, having people go through the core loop and tracking their, their progress through that is very, very, very helpful for figuring out how these kind of games work. Uh, and figure out where pe why people aren't enjoying your game. And you can do stuff like correlate certain behaviors with people who are returning, and you can do so many things. And these are the three main, uh, these are the three main options for uh, analytics tracking on Roblox right now. I believe uh, they have public API, like uh, modules that you can use to easily access them. I personally use the PlayFab one because uh, I, I like uh, how they get allow me to interact directly with the database, though it currently is closed to the wider public. So if you are not able to get into that program, um, then definitely Google Analytics is helpful because it'll, I, I've using it, I've been able to just get a, be able to export Excel sheets of like 20,000 rows. Um, if you know SQL, definitely do something SQL based. Databases as I said, are very helpful. Um, game Analytics is good for high level stuff. They allow you to make custom events, which are pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, so like game analytics, give it a shot. Um, it's very helpful. I, I took a class on it and it's been influencing the way I view game development ever since. And also important thing to recognize, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty awesome. I definitely, uh, uh, definitely apply and hopefully they get it out to people, but I, I know I'm sure they're, if they are, if it's any delays are for the betterment of the, of the experience for everyone. Um, but the law of large numbers, this is mostly just showing you why you need more testers and why, in some cases, analytics just really can't help you. If you don't have the budget to put up a bunch of ads or if you don't have um, a community to show stuff to, analytics can be, can be difficult. I, I think in order to get a usable sample size for anything analytics-wise, you usually need to put up around, uh, around a, a three to 4,000 in Robux. Uh, because if you look right in like the 200 and before in the 200 range, you'll get like massive errors from 20 to 40 percent uh, that seem to reduce over time, which is good. But the more tr the more samples you have, the more reliable your information is. And it really isn't until the uh, thousand mark. But honestly, in my opinion, I like going all the way to the 4,000 mark uh, to be because that's usually less than one percent. And so analytics will almost always require large data sets. If, you, if you're trying to run it off of 50 people, just know you could have a skew of up to 30%. So try to visualize that and see why it could cause, uh, cause problems. Because, um, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, and it, instead of just kind of posted a link to the PlayFab program, so definitely apply to that if you haven't already. 
yeah, so the sample size stuff, that's important. Uh, it's also why just in-person playtesting can be helpful, but since you are making your game for a large group of people, not an individual, I would not put too much merit into a single playtest. No matter what you do, you want to get it in front of as many people as possible, because the more people will see it, the more reliable your insights will be. And analytics just allows you to automate the process. Okay, now onboarding. <laughs> Pain is temporary, quitting lasts forever. Onboarding is, uh, this is a little bit uh, of an offshoot from the main topic, but I think it's very important because from what I can tell, most of the games on Roblox, in fact, most of the games in general, which fail to get an audience, um, a lot of them seem to really fail at the, uh, at the onboarding stuff. Because tell me, of, of all the games you know of, just in general, how many of them are like, okay, let me bring it down a little bit. In my Steam library, I have about 50 or so games. I played maybe 10 of them. I thought I'd like the other 40, I didn't. I got it, I, I played it for like an hour. I couldn't get into it, and so I left. Now that could be because the motivation for that experience did not line up with what I usually expect from a game. But I bought those games thinking I'd like them. People enter your game thinking they'll like it. Like when someone sees the Adopt Me icon, they already know what this game is. They, they're not surprised when it's, when it's a, a social hangout. Um, when people see the Phantom Forces, they don't think, is this a pet adoption game? No, no, no. They, they know it's shooting and combat and, and competitive. Like, so in a sense, all the stuff we've talked about um, is partially marketing. Like, 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 sure, if you do it wrong, people will get in and then it won't match. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm with you, Tyrod. Um, yeah, no, the people people will get into the game. And if you fail at the motivation part, um, you failed. But at the same time, you can... I, I, I genuinely believe a good onboarding process will get even an okay fun game an audience. Like, uh, like it, so long as it's better than nothing. <laughs> like, uh, though obviously aim for fun, aim for, aim for perfect, aim for uh, getting that, uh, the most compelling experience you can. But the games that fail are rarely just the most dull, boring, miserable experiences ever like like they're not like they're, they're, there's almost always a semi-compelling part to it and i feel like a lot of them they just lose people either because they'll get to a point and they won't realize that the best parts around the corner or they, they won't understand it roblox games and i'm speaking from experience are horrible with tutorials all right yeah no see ya yeah uh yeah th thank you for attending uh the all of these, all of these like uh, games could be so fun. Like, what, what's that one game which Curtis is always talking about? Does anyone here know Busy City Guy? <laughs> it's, what's the game he always talks about? It was made by David. What was it? It's a really fun game. No, no, it's the it's the one with like the tubes, and it's like a, apocalyptic. Anyway. Uh, does anyone know it has like its own little cult following? Uh, Curtis is going to kill me. Uh, Eclipsis! Eclipsis! That was it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Eclipsis is a great example. Um, so, uh, JV Dad ha has asked, um, it's a good idea to release and keep iterating to try to make it better. Um, yes, release as early as possible. But when, when I say release, I mean release it to testers. A play test, you can do that as early as a week after you started. Heck, maybe even the same day of if you're doing like game jam speeds. Uh, don't wait until the last minute to start showing people your game. But at the same time, you don't necessarily need to have a full release to get testers in. I personally just have uh, community members apply for testing and I give everyone testing. But at the very least, it means that I won't, the game won't spiral to the front page unexpectedly. And also, if you use group access to your game, uh, people can't download it. So if it sucks, that's fine. Uh, they can't download it yet. You can improve it. Uh, yeah, so that's why I love group access. And, oh yeah, but uh, Eclipsis. Eclipsis is super, uh, it's a super fun game. It has a steep learning curve, com comparably to other Roblox games. Like go to like, Natural Disaster Survival, what's there to learn? You literally just stand around, they teleport you to the fun, 
and then you just don't die. And if you do die, that's still fun. Like, like that, that, it's a very accessible game. And that's why strategy games in general have more trouble in Roblox. Uh, for once, a younger audience, so they might not necessarily be as patient to learn something, but I at no way believe, I don't think that the mechanics of Eclipsis are inherently too difficult for a child to understand. I, 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 I was in chess club when I was in elementary school. Um, just in case you didn't think I was cool enough. <laughs> um, yeah, and I could play it. Beat my parents a few times. Or they let me win. Honestly, looking back, it could have been either. And my point is, I was able to understand compl more complicated rules and s more complicated emergent behaviors and strategies. Um, hey, nice to meet you. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for showing up. Yeah, I I'll probably be wrapping this up soon as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. It's been an hour and a half. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, um, yeah, so with... Yeah, yeah, no, it's been it's been great. I want to keep doing these. Uh, the yeah, honestly, I'm just I'm just happy that like it didn't like drop to like five people after the first ten minutes. Oh, that was a fear of mine. And like I had the attendees thing slowly dropping in the corner, so it's just I know I do, I know I got to wrap it up. All right, the yeah, uh, but no, teaching the people the game is so important, it's so important. Uh, in fact, that's what saved superhero life too. As I said, Sorkis playtested and said add a tutorial. And uh, in terms of the types of tutorial you add, obviously some of you guys are aware that, uh, uh, some of y'all know that the forced tutorial, where like you can't do anything except for do the tutorial, is boring. And people will quit just because it's boring. And, and then oftentimes, like the image says, which is on Amazon, by the way, uh, I feel like I gotta rep it because I've used it in my presentation. Though this presentation isn't for profit, so I think I'm fine. I don't know. Um, the pain is temporary, quitting lasts forever. And they said that like as a joke, but it's also very true. People will make a snap judgment of your game and never come back. And that's horrifying. Especially when you look at the the, the like the, the D1, D7 uh, uh, like like people returning to your game. And you see that like, oh, six percent of people come to my game and then never come back. That six percent of people who you probably screwed up the onboarding experience for, like uh, <laughs> skip tutorial is something people do. I'm not sure I recommend it because if someone skips a tutorial, they're just saying I don't want to sit through a boring tutorial. They're not necessarily saying I already know what I'm doing. What I usually advise is sort of a passive tutorial, which like is contextual. You when you when you open up a UI, it might a little like, character might jump down and be like, "Hey there." Uh, here's how you do these things. And, uh, yeah, I'm available for voice acting for that character. Should you like? Yes. Uh, hello there. Welcome to this new game. To your left, you will find a volcano. And to your right, you will find a house builder. All right. I don't know. Uh, that'd be a fun game. All right. Back on topic. I'm going to lose all of you. <laughs> uh, the onboarding is very important and i think that's the last slide but honestly i don't remember these things i was in a bike accident i don't remember a whole lot of stuff all the time wear a helmet y'all okay yeah keep improving your game honestly uh and i as a person who has 100 games on his portfolio obviously i don't necessarily live perfectly by that because i do move you can move on from games it's okay to move on from games i moved on from mortal metal but Improving your ability through a single game can be very helpful. A lot of what I've learned, honestly, has come from not the 100 games I've made, but the last 10, which I focused on, which I tried to improve, which I tried to get better. Because if you keep making a new game a week, you'll get really good at making that week-long game. So what happens when you get to week two on a good idea? You'll be, you'll, you won't know what to do. So like, uh, this is actually something we'll see on, the, on, on onboarding with analytics. 100% of the players are there for the, like the first 10 seconds, 90% are there for the first minute, 50% are there for the first two minutes, and you just see it diminish. Don't let your education be like that. Study the end game and the early game. And uh, yeah, you. Uh, so I think that's about it. I'm fairly certain this is the last slide. Yeah, that is the last slide. So now uh, we can pop over to Q&A, uh, should you like.